All right, hello everybody. Um, today we're going to be talking about the plasma membrane. Um, we will have a short discussion about the cytoskeleton at the beginning. Um, and as usual, I would like to say thank you to the work of David Kanefke. I have stolen many of his ideas and quoted him directly on occasion. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the cytoskeleton. AP doesn't say a whole lot about how much you need to know about the cytoskeleton. You definitely need to know everything there is to know about the cell membrane. Okay, I'm completely exaggerating. But let's do a quick overview of the cytoskeleton because it could be something that comes up in a test question. Uh, and I want you to be familiar with the terms. It's not that you need to memorize any of this. Okay, so what is the cytoskeleton? Well, it's a network of proteins that extends throughout the cytoplasm, and there are three different types. There's microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. Excuse me, this photo, this diagram, <coughs> excuse me, um, came straight out of our textbook and it shows you sort of what they look like and what some of their functions are. I'm going to get, introduce you a little bit more to the microtubules than the others, um, but just be aware microtubules are important um, for things like cell motility, which is the movement of cells. Um, it's important in um, cilia and flagella, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, the microfilaments do lots of things, um, including muscle contractions. So that's one way that you might recognize them. We'll also see them as something that kind of anchor the cell membrane down, and that'll come up in a little bit. And then intermediate filaments, I'm not even going to bother going over. Just be aware that that's another type of um, structural protein that works in the cell. All right, so what are some functions of the um, cytoskeleton? Well, it provides support for the cell. It keeps the cell from collapsing in on itself. Um, it anchors the organelles into the correct location so that they're not you know, in the wrong place. So um, when certain reactions are happening in the cell, they have to, the organelles have to be in the right place. Um, they regulate cell and organelle movement, um, and they move chromosomes during cell division. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, this is just an FYI. You see this in the movie, um, in the, the little thing that we've seen, the documentary called Inner Life of a Cell. Um, and everybody thinks of him as this little walking guy. That is a um, motor protein and he is carrying a vesicle on his back. I love saying he because he cracks me up. Um, but what he is walking on is part of the cytoskeleton. And you can see the cytoskeleton in the background of that photo. Um, he's walking on a, um, a microtubule, which is a hollow um, piece of um, protein. And we'll, we'll learn more about that in a second. So microtubules are important in three really main structures in the cell. Um, number one, well, I guess these are outside the cell, cilia and flagella. Um, these are both super important for allowing a cell to move through space. So the, the flagellum, singular is flagellum, um, plural is flagella. And they're kind of like a whip-like tail that'll, that projects the cell through space. Um, so cilia are similar, but much shorter, and you usually have lots of them. So cilia beat, um, and that's what moves the cell through space. Um, and then flagella, you usually only have one to three of them on a cell, um, and they kind of um, wave back and forth, and that's what moves the cell. They have super interesting structure. That's why we're talking about them right now. They're made of um, bundles of microtubules. Um, this is a cross-section. That photo, the black and white photo, is a cross-section. So if we have a cilia and we cut it like this and then we show it to you, we look right at it, um, it's a whole bunch of microtubules that are paired together. We're not going to go into the details of it, but it's a pretty cool structure. Um, and then the last thing, oh, my dog's getting ready to bark. Give me just a second. I might need to pause the video. Um, the last thing that's made out of microtubules are called the centrioles, which is sometimes referred to as the centrosome. Um, it's going to become that particular organelle is going to become more important when we talk about cell division. So that's mitosis and meiosis. Um, because those centrioles grab hold of the um, chromosomes and then ratchet them, pull them to opposite sides of the cell. So they are barrel-shaped organelles found at right angles to one another. So notice that one is running this way and one is running this direction, um, and they're made they're made of hollow tubules, so microtubules, and then they separate um, chromosomes during cell division. All right, now we're getting into the meat of what you really need to know. So this is just a super interesting experiment that was um, done in your book talks about. Um, so they um, scientists fused two different types of cells, a mouse cell that had its own distinctive proteins and a human cell that had its own distinctive proteins. I'm sure lots of you are like, oh my gosh, that's freaky. Um, don't worry, there was no being that came out of this. Um, it was just to study the proteins on the surface of both cells. 
And what they discovered is after an hour of the two cells um, being merged into a hybrid cell, the proteins were mixed all over. And so the conclusion that they draw is that at least some of the membrane proteins are mobile within the plasma membrane. They're not fixed in place. And so that's where we come up with what's called the fluid mosaic model for the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. Plasma membrane is the real name. Cell membrane is kind of like the seventh grade version of it. I, I talk like a seventh grader sometimes because I think it's easier for my students to remember sometimes. So plasma membrane is the official name. Um, pro, so the fluid mosaic model basically says that proteins are floating around the outside of the membrane or within the membrane, um, kind of like icebergs move around in the ocean. Now that's not all proteins. Some of them are actually in fixed positions, but many proteins float around um, the position. So then it says um, the structure of the plasma membrane, it is a phospholipid bilayer, we already learned this in biochemistry, with associated proteins. So now we're adding what we learned in biochemistry. This diagram that we have here, you should be able to identify everything in this diagram for our test um, other than globular protein and alpha helix protein. Everything other than those two are things that could be on a test. All right, um, and then this is the same slide, except I changed pictures just because I think it's an interesting picture. Um, scientists have been able to cut through the cell membrane and separate the two layers of the of the bilayer um, and then photograph it using um, special electron micro microscopy. Um, and it's kind of cool to see the inside and the bumps and the um, the protein bumps on the inside and then the um, of both layers, I guess is all, all I'm saying. It's just cool to look at. All right, moving on. So the function of the cell membrane, I'm going to get my picture. I don't know where to put my picture, so I'm just going to leave it there. The function of the plasma membrane, it serves as a boundary of the cell. Remember that we've been talking about compartmentalization and that um, this, the body, our body couldn't function if it was just a huge blob of, you know, mitochondria and whatever. The cells actually provide a compartment themselves, but then within the cells, there are compartments of organelles. Um, so it provides a boundary where certain reactions Actions can occur. It transports materials in and out. So just as an example, there are many things that come in and out, but say nutrients come in and waste has to leave. Um, when our, our mitochondria are doing cell respiration, oxygen needs to come in and carbon dioxide needs to go out. And then it is important also in communication between cells and the environment. And that is a wacky concept that your cells are capable of communicating, but they completely are. So just take a look at the diagram. We see the phospholipid bilayer in the diagram. And then there's an embedded protein that they have labeled receptor. And we're going to talk more about that. And then there's a special shape that says hormone. That hormone is a messenger, um, basically transporting a message to the cell. Um, and it's telling the cell through a series of chemical reactions that are going on inside of the cell, that it's time for the cell to do whatever the cell does. We don't want the cell um, building whatever it builds, let's say, I, I don't know what it builds, whatever it builds. We don't want it building it 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That's wasteful. We only want it, it wastes energy. We only want it to build its products when those products are needed by the rest of the body. So how does it know when to build those products? Messengers like hormones that that click onto it, onto the receptor, and it says, okay, now is the time to build your product. Um, and so that's a message that gets received. That's called signal transduction, when the signal transfers from the outside of the cell into the inside. And we'll learn a lot more about that in an upcoming unit. Okay, let's talk about the phospholipids themselves. This should be review from biochemistry. They are lipids with a phosphate attached to a glycerol in place of an, a fatty acid tail. So instead of being triglycerides that had three fatty acids um, tails, they have two fatty acid tails. Um, they have a polar or hydrophilic. Remember, hydro means water and phil means loving. So they have a water-loving phosphate head and nonpolar fatty acid tails. So here's a new word that we didn't really have in biochemistry, and that's the word amphipathic. Um, amphibious means that it can, um, like a, an amphibian can go both, live on both land and in water. It has times in its life when it lives on land and lives on wa in water. Um, that's what makes it amphibious. So the polar and nonpolar areas of um, the phospholipids make them amphipathic. And there are other molecules that are also amphipathic. Sometimes proteins are amphipathic. 
Um, and then we learned that the um, the lipid bilayer just forms automatically. It spontaneously occurs when the phospholipids are placed into a liquid um, that's water. Um, and then it's fluid. The phospholipids, if you look at the diagram, the phospholipids are also changing places, just like the proteins are moving around. The phospholipids can switch places. They can even switch which side of the membrane they are on. Okay, the function of the phospholipids, kind of a funny function, but they create as a whole, they create a selectively permeable membrane. So selectively permeable means only certain things can permeate, pass through the cell membrane. So it determines what can come in and what cannot. What can pass through the cell membrane itself is just small things that are nonpolar. So they are capable of squeezing in between the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, because they are not polar, they aren't attracted to the heads, they don't get stuck at the heads. So they can squeeze in between the phospholipid bilayer. Um, however, other molecules that have different types, like that are polar or are larger, they can be transported across the cell membrane membrane through proteins. So those big purple proteins that, that go on both sides, the um, other molecules can be transported through them. Okay, and then let's just give you an example of an important phospholipid, the glycolipids. Now, as far as we're concerned in this class, glycolipids and glycoproteins, which you can see them in the diagram there, and I'll explain them, they're virtually synonyms in this class. They are not actually synonyms, and, and we can talk about the structure, how they're different. Um, a glycolipid is a phospholipid that has um, a polysaccharide attached to it. So please look at the diagram look at where it says carbohydrate. Do you see that it's a series of hexagons? Those are a bunch of monosaccharides put together to make a polysaccharide. Depending on where those um, carbohydrates are attached, if they're attached in this diagram, the proteins are blue. If they're attached to a protein, then they're called glycoproteins. If they're attached to the head of a phospholipid, they're called glycolipids. So structurally, they're a little different. It depends on whether they're attached to a protein or a lipid. Um, as far as function, in our class, we're going to say they're both important in cell recognition. So identifying that this cell belongs there, that it belongs to you, that it's not a foreign invader, we'll say that's what both glycolipids and glycoproteins do. You can see some other functions that glycolipids um, are important in, um, cell development, contact inhibition. We're going to learn more about contact inhibition later. It's the idea that just as an example, if you have a wound and there's an opening in the cells because cells got ripped away, the cells start dividing to close the wound. So when do they stop dividing? Well, it's when they touch each other, they contact each other. They've now closed the wound. And then inhibition means, okay, now you stop dividing. You don't keep dividing once the wound is closed. Um, so contact inhibition, they touch each other and they recognize that through the glycolipids. When the glycolipids touch, they recognize, okay, it's time to stop dividing. And we're going to learn about that more because that's a flaw in cancer cells. Cancer cells are supposed to have contact inhibition, but they don't. And so they touch each other and they still keep dividing. And that's what forms a tumor. We'll learn more about it. It's super interesting stuff. All right, cholesterol. Take a look at these diagrams before I say anything more about cholesterol. Let's look at the top two diagrams where it says fluid and viscous. Um, you've got a phospholipid bilayer. Notice that if it's got unsaturated fatty acids in the tails, remember that unsaturated fatty acids have a double bond and that causes a kink in the fatty acid itself. That kink can actually be really important. It allows the cell membrane to be more fluid, so it's more flexible. If, however, the cell membrane needs to be a little bit tougher, more, the word is viscous, I don't have a great other word for it. If it's supposed to be a little bit more viscous, then we want saturated fatty acid tails that pack more tightly and allow the cell membrane to be, rigid is not the right word at all, but just a little bit less fluid. I, I, there's no other word for it. Okay, so what's the role of cholesterol? Well, take a, take a look at the diagram on the bottom, um, letter B. Notice the shape of the cholesterols. That should be a familiar shape. Those are not carbon 
carbohydrates. Those are actually steroid lipids. Remember, those are the fused rings. So cholesterol is a fused ring. It's made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And it has a super interesting function. It acts as a temperature buffer. So the, the having cholesterol in the cell membrane is a good thing. I know you know that cholesterol is bad. It's only bad in certain circumstances. And in this circumstance, it's a good thing. So it allows the um, cell membrane to have the correct fluidity over various temperatures. So the membranes have to be fluid in order to work properly. Here's a quote directly from your book. Cholesterol reduces membrane fluidity at moderate temperatures by reducing phospholipid movement. So that means that it makes it less fluid at warm temperatures. So we don't want our, um, just imagine for a second, let's think about fat. So think about animal fat when you're cooking. Um, if you heat up hamburger meat, I'm a vegetarian, but whatever, if you heat up hamburger meat, the fat becomes liquid. If you then stop heating it up, the fat solidifies. Well, we can't have liquid fat and we can't have solid fat. Cholesterol moderates that so that it's just the right fluidity. Um, no matter what the temperature is within reason. Um, so it's the correct fluidity at moderate temps by reducing how much those phospholipids move around. But at really low temperatures, it stops the, um, <clears throat> the solidification of the fat by hindering um, the, the regular packing of the phospholipids. So they can't pack together and form sort of like a, a solid structure. So the cholesterol keeps it a little bit um, fluid. So cholesterol is good in moderation. However, some of you know high LDL cholesterol um, in the blood can damage blood vessels. That's not something we really talk about in AP biology, but it's a super interesting area. Um, and those of you that are interested in medicine will learn all about that. All right, let's take a look at this diagram now. You need to know pretty much everything in this diagram. So let's just wrap our brains around it before we go any further. So on the, across the top, there's all these like fibers sticking around. That's called the ECM, the extracellular matrix. We're going to learn about that in just a second. Um, notice the wave you've got. That's the phospholipid bilayer. So that's the plasma membrane. And then embedded in the plasma membrane are purple blobs. And those purple blobs are the proteins. Um, remember that you've learned all kinds of stuff about protein structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. We can't draw all of that when we're drawing these diagrams. It's too complex. So your book is always going to draw proteins in purple. Always. I love the consistency because that helps your eyes start to go, oh, that's a protein. Um, and they just look like blobs, but they are very complicated structures. So integral proteins are proteins, I'm going to try to get out of my way, out of the way here. They are proteins that typically penetrate both layers of the bilayer. So I think I just covered it up with my picture. We'll try moving it one more time. Here's an example of an integral protein right there. You see the label integral protein. So it's a protein that um, its head pops above the top and its tail is stuck down below. There are also things called peripheral proteins. Peripheral proteins are either on top of the cell or they're stuck to the bottom of the cell, but they don't penetrate. All the way through like the integral proteins do. Okay, here's a super important idea. In order for a protein to stay in place embedded in the cell membrane, the cell membrane has polar heads and nonpolar tails and then polar heads again. So in order for the an integral protein to stay put, its polarity has to vary on the outside in order to stay in place. So it has to be fairly polar on the top where it's near the polar phospholipid heads. It needs to be nonpolar in the middle of its structure so that it can stay put in those nonpolar tails. And then it has to have an area of polarity down at the bottom where it's sitting amongst all the polar heads of the um, phospholipids. So it says areas closest to the phospholipid heads are polar, areas closest to the tails are nonpolar. And just an FYI, because it's going to come up in a second, some of those integral proteins have, this is a gross oversimplification, but we're going to say it has, a, they have tunnels running through the middle. The polarity of those tunnels is also super important because that determines what molecules can move from the outside of the cell inside or from the inside of the cell outside. So we're going to talk about that more coming up. All right, so these are some examples of what 
proteins that are embedded in cell membranes do. So the first one I just kind of mentioned when I said it had tunnels in it, um, those are transport proteins and they allow molecules to move either direction. Sometimes they don't require energy and sometimes they require the addition of ATP. Um, some proteins are enzymes. They speed up reactions that are going on in the cell and they're embedded in the, some are embedded in the cell membrane. Um, some are receptors. So we talked about the hormone and it triggering this um, response on the inside of the cell. So some proteins are the ones that receive those um, molecules. Some are called glycoproteins, and I mentioned we're going to compare them to glycolipids. We'll talk about them in just a second here. Um, but they allow cells to recognize each other. Some allow um, cells to join each other, so they're actually attached via proteins. And then others, the proteins are attached either to the extracellular matrix that is moving above, or not moving, is um, fibers, <coughs> excuse me, on the outside of a cell, or they're attached to the microfilaments that are on the inside of the cell. All right, so let's just mention a few things. The membrane receptors, we're just giving you an example of a membrane protein. So the structure, the, they are integral proteins with regions that extend both above and above the cell to the extracellular area and to the inside, the intracellular area. Their functions, I kind of already mentioned, um, they do what's called signal transduction. So that means they receive a signal from outside the cell and they um, relay that signal through the inside of the cell to some outcome so that there's some kind of a response by the cell. We'll learn a lot more about that soon. Okay, membrane proteins, still these receptors, this has to do with viruses, and especially when we're talking about coronavirus, it's really interesting stuff. Membrane receptors are exploited by viruses. That means that viruses take advantage of the fact that we have these membrane receptors. Well, how do they do that? Um, I'll explain the image in just a second. Proteins on the surface of viruses look like look like they're they're chemically similar to um, proteins that receptors recognize and they invite the virus inside they think oh this is a harmless molecule and they bring the the virus inside and that's when the virus takes over bad news um, so take a look at this hiv it's absolutely fascinating um, this is specific to hiv hiv uses two receptors the first receptor is called the cd4 receptor and then there are certain um, white blood cells that have another receptor called the CCR5. It's a co-receptor. If a cell does not have the CCR5, um, HIV is not invited in. But our white blood cells have that second receptor, so HIV enters our white blood cells, and that's our immune system. Our immune system gets destroyed, and we eventually die from HIV, not because HIV killed us, but because we die from some other infection that our immune system no longer functions to destroy. However, the part that's super interesting is that there are certain people who have a mutation, and we can talk about this in depth because it's fascinating, um, but they're missing the CCR5 co-receptor, and so they are immune to HIV. HIV can never enter any of their cells, including their white blood cells. That's pretty cool stuff. All right. Um, and then we mentioned um, glycoproteins a little bit ago with the glycolipids. They are integral proteins that span the bilayer. So they're going both ways um, and they have polysaccharides attached to them, carbohydrates. Um, and so I want you to just imagine for a second that the cell that's on top is a white blood cell. And its job is to recognize whether cells are foreign invaders or whether they belong there. And so this white blood cell on top is... Um, touching the glycoprotein um, and identifying it as, oh, this is a familiar cell. It belongs here. I won't attack it. So we call that cell to cell recognition. Glycoproteins serve as an identifying marker. It's called an antigen in cellular populations like in your bo body. However, this is sad and interesting. Glycoproteins are a complication for organ transplants. That's because our white blood cells after an organ transplant continue to travel through our body and they recognize, they, they clamp on to the glycoproteins, but now the glycoproteins are foreign. They are not recognized as part of the body. And so the white blood cell is triggered to attack. And that's when we reject um, an organ. And so the only way to not reject an organ is to take immunosuppressant drugs, um, which makes people vulnerable to diseases like coronavirus.
All right, and then outside the cell, we're almost done, you guys. The last big slide um, is called the extracellular matrix. We already mentioned it. It's a network of connective proteins and proteoglycan molecules. I'll explain that in just a second. Outside of the cell membrane of animal cells. Proteo means protein, gly, G-L-Y-C is a reference to carbohydrates. So it's a combination of protein and carbohydrates. And its function is to anchor cells in place. Um, so just really quickly, cells need to stay in place that's super important that they don't go floating away. They do go floating away during cancer. That's called metastasizing. Um, they break away from the other cells. They float and they start growing on the brain or they grow somewhere else. Um, and that's a very serious and dangerous condition that happens with um, cancer. So they help to anchor the cell. And then it just says here, FYI, microfilaments. So if you look at the bottom of the diagram, there's microfilaments on the inside. The ECM is on the outside. The microfilaments are on the inside. Um, within the cell cytoplasm, also attached to the plasma membrane for purposes of cell movement or membrane stability. So there's attachments above and there's attachments below. But not all of it's attached because it's still fluid. So just some of it is attached. All right. Um, so I just thought I'd do this really quick. KJ, what do I absolutely need to know about the plasma membrane, you need to know it's a phospholipid bilayer, that it has polar phosphate heads and nonpolar fatty acid tails. You need to know the phrase fluid mosaic model. Many of the embedded proteins are moving, I think it says around, is that what it says? Moving, or just moving. Okay. Um, you need to know the phrase selectively permeable. That means that only certain molecules can pass through. So small nonpolar molecules can go right between the phospholipid bilayer. And then larger molecules or polar molecules usually need a transport protein to, with a tunnel, for example, um, to allow them to pass through. You need to know the difference between integral proteins and peripheral proteins. Integral proteins um, span both layers. The peripheral proteins are either on the top or the bottom. You need to understand that the polarity of integral proteins varies throughout the structure. Um, so that it can sit within the membrane, which has both polar and nonpolar regions. Amphipathic. There's a new word. Okay, and then um, what else do you absolutely need to know? You should be able to draw, label, and give the functions for everything in the diagram below. The only thing I was trying to see, I think I... Yeah, I don't see anything that you don't need to know on this diagram. It's an awesome diagram. So cholesterol, remember, those are steroid lipids, fused rings. Don't, don't mix them up with um, carbohydrates. Easy to mix them up. Um, that they change the fluidity of the membrane for the better. So they're helpful. They make it less fluid at warmer temperatures and more, um, more fluid at lower temperatures. And then the glycolipids and glycoproteins, we're going to say, we're just going to lump them together and say they're important in cell recogni recognition. And then finally, the ECM, you you need to know that it's important in cell anchorage. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Let me know if you have any questions.